Warning, do not listen to this podcast if hearing about freedom and liberty is not legal for you in your community. And if so, you should immediately move to a hipper community. Welcome to the Freedom Fiends Podcast, a weekly web lab where Michael W. Dean and Nima Vadadi cover the punk rockinist, hip hopinist current events, as well as timeless universal truths about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, because there's no such thing as half free. The Freedom Fiends Podcast, available from freedomfiends.com. That's F R E E D O M F E E N S dot com. Freedom Fiends is proudly syndicated by Alterati.com and the Liberty Radio Network at LRN.FM. Welcome to the Freedom Fiends Distance Learning Anarchy Series with Freedom Fiends Michael W. Dean. Broadcasting from my windowless bunker. And Nima Vidati. Go, go, Freedom Fiends! Freedom Fiends, yo. It's the Fiends. What'd it do? Yeah. You yeah. know, today today I wish I had a cheaper mic. Um, they're doing like construction next door, like two houses over over the sewer, and there's all these machines out there. It's probably going to pick it up. You know, I wish I had like an SM58. Uh, well, do I do I hear the signal that, that you're recording right now? That's what I hear, right? Because I don't hear any, any background noise. Sounds good okay. to me. Listen quietly. Do you hear it? No, but I think mumble has its own like natural compression and noise canceling that it adds. So maybe uh, I'm, I hear uh, something different than what whatever you're. Although we're recording the straight up mumble symbol too, signal too, aren't we? Yeah. Well, okay. if you don't hear it, maybe we're good then. I mean, I've got my choices are condenser mics that have cardioid, you know, pretty much just in front uh, uh, some patterns, but. They're also incredibly sensitive, and but I'm using my ribbon mic, which is you know better at background noise, but it also records from both sides, and one side's facing the window, so ah, uh, yeah, windows closed, but I can hear it, but maybe you can't. Hmm. I can't. I remember uh, Ben Stone used to always say, "Oh, you probably hear a lot of background noise," but I wouldn't hear any or much yeah. at all, if anything. Well, Ben and I had a talk yesterday about never pointing out what's wrong. <laughs> and then you go ahead and start off the cast with that. <laughs> I know. I know, <laughs> Hypocrite. I know. Well, we have an excuse because we do audio tips. So uh, okay. I'm okay. saying that, you know, a an SM58 um, can, uh, capsule mic, you know, uh, dynamic mic would be more noise canceling behind it than the ribbon mic, which is uh, uh, by, it's a by pattern. It's equal from front and back. Right, right. For some reason. But we also found that if you flip it backwards, at least the one, the ones you and me have, the RSMs, um, they actually sound a little bit sweeter. So the sound going into the back actually yeah. is a little bit different than the sound going into the front. It's so weird. Why don't they make that the front? I don't know. Maybe so power users can sound better than, than rookies. <laughs> so my it's dad. Like, it's like a crisscross thing. We, we, we wear our mics backwards. <laughs> so my dad is coming to visit at the end of the Ooh. month. So he may get to be a, uh, in, in studio guest on the Freedom really? Fans Live at some point. Yep. That should be interesting. Yeah. I'd be interested to talk to your dad. We've already heard my mom like a million times on the Fiends. So yep. Yeah. It'd be nice to hear, hear what the person who made you has to say. Well, he can tell us how Sarah Palin's going to save us from the Muslims. <laughs> White girls politic, and that's that Sarah Palin. <laughs> What's that from? Uh, it's a line in a great song called Mercy by Kanye West. I think Big Sean and Pusha T and maybe one other MC that I'm forgetting. That's funny. That's funny. Yeah, yeah. So I got a little, uh, I don't know if it's news you can use, but um, I wanted to point out, I think we've been having trouble with people being on the wrong feed at the, when we're doing our live show, they, yeah. don't real, they don't realize there's two feeds. And this keeps happening again and again and again. And I think that that's some of the, like, people calling in and they have, you know, either, you know, you said maybe they think that we have, like, a call center to route it and put them on hold. But I think sometimes, and I know sometimes, people are listening to the archived non-live streaming feed, which is the listen now blue link on the button. 
or button on the on the podcast on the on the Freedom Fiends website. Mm-hmm. That that is never live. Well, it may be at some point in the future if we add a third cast, you know, like a live week cast, midweek right. cast. But so far, that's just uh, you know for listening to Freedom Fiends Radio, which is an archive of every episode we've done, every Anarchy Gumbo we've ever done, every interview we've ever done on other podcasts, and a bunch just of played music. on a loop, yeah. right? And a bunch of music. I mean, the loop is like. Three days long, and then people listen right. for three days. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's that's completely different. The live show is actually on lrn.fm. Yeah, and that link you can find by on our website going to the live show page, which is called. Uh, let me see what it's called here. We got the page. We got the page it's coming up. It's called. There's a link at the top. It says live call in show, and if you go to that, that has the lrn link, which we're. We're on in archive in the middle of the night, but we're every night, but we're only on that live Sunday from th- uh, five to seven East Coast time. Right, right. Although yeah. adaptation to our customers' needs is a, a good virtue to have. I'm wondering, maybe we should, would it be too much trouble just to put butt on uh, during the, and, the live and broadcast shows? live. I thought about that. So, so um, it'd be dual casting. I definitely thought about that today. And. I think that's doable, but I think I need to work out a little more of the, like, I'm scrambling with so much stuff on my end. Maybe you could do it on your end. Test the butt? Yeah, I could test you know, the butt. Um, I'm although, a butt specialist. <laughs> I had to, you know, it requires a couple computers, too. You don't know if okay. you have enough computers. Okay. And well, have... my wife's been doing job interviews all week, so hopefully she'll have a, a day job soon, and I'll have all this time to myself. to. And I can also have her computer because while she's gone, she'll leave her extra computer. So okay. I can try it out. Well, if we do that, we will announce that. Yeah. Yes. But yeah, you're right. I think it was Randy England's call during the last live show, which was a great call. Uh, I think we held him over for two oh, segments. Yeah. But when oh, he yeah. first called, he was like, yeah, you were talking about, oh, what was it? Something. DUIs, people, cops DUI holding people blood down testing. for blood testing. And That's I was like, right. he was like, you were talking about DUI blood testing. And I was like, yeah, about 11 months ago. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, he didn't know. I wasn't calling him dumb. I was just like, uh, you know, I, and I was one because I was wondering, like, I've had a lot of off mic conversations with him about law. And uh-huh. I was wondering, like, you know, t- t- two weeks ago, was I, like, sleep dialing and talking to him about this and didn't remember, <laughs> and he was just picking it up from there or something? But no, it was playing at that moment on our archive feed streams. Right, right, right. So he was listening to an older episode where, indeed, you were talking about DUI and we were. cops holding you down to pull blood out of your body. Yep. Which, we were- <sighs> I asked him about if if it's a Fifth Amendment kind of thing, and he said no, because in the Fifth Amendment it says, you know, you basically you can't testify against yourself. Well, yeah. But I, mean, I still think that you can expand that to mean the spirit of the law, I think, meant self-incriminating. In I don't know. It was it was so weird at that point because I was so, like, in lib hair at the moment talking about, you know, uh, that book, Anatomy of the State by... What's his name? Come on, man. Help me Murray out. Rothbard. Murray Rothbard. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was like, what? You want to talk about reality? No, man. We're in lib, <laughs> we're in lib pair here. It was, but, it was- but Brandy's conversation did end up going there. I mean, when he was talking about um, the situation where the mother births the baby and then kills yeah, it. In the, yeah. Or doesn't kill it, but, but neglects to feed it and it dies. <laughs> which which sounded like, you know, the horrors of Lib Pair as described in Crack Magazine in that article we read or something, you know, about how they're in Lib Pair, they're, you know, they're, they're, the problem of, of indigent children would be taken away by keeping them in brothels. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, and, you know, I brought up shunning, you know, you could just shun the parent and not do business with her. And, and I think Randy said, well, that kind of kind of could work, but I'm not a believer that that's the only solution you have. Yeah, I don't think shunning is the only solution. And again, I'm not like putting down Randy for calling in with a great question. I was just I was off in fantasy land at the time. Okay. Which, okay. you know, part of creating lip hair is picturing it because, you know, you can't invent a cell phone until you can picture a cell phone. You can't you mm-hmm. can't invent, you know, wireless transmission of radio or uh, you know, internal combustion engine without picturing it. You know, you got to picture the fantasy. The sci- science right. fiction becomes science fact. Right, right. Vision comes before innovation. Yeah. So um we have a bunch of new listeners on the streaming feed in weird places. We got some a couple of people in China are listening for like 8 hours at a time. Somebody 
is listening a lot from Myanmar. You know where that is? Ah, My- Myanmar, yeah, yeah, that's Burma. Southeast Asia. It's yeah, Burma, it used to be called Burma, which is one of the most repressive repressive regimes ever. Their current <gasps> politics. Right, right. In fact, um, the gentleman Will Coley, who I interviewed, it's an upcoming gumbo interview. Oh yeah, this uh, Saturday comes out. He was he was talking about it a little bit in the repressive regime there, and um. I didn't know they actually changed. He, according to him, uh, they changed the name from Burma to Myanmar in part to combat their horrible PR about how repressive Burma was. But now it's been Myanmar for like a decade or more, and so <laughs> I wonder if they're going to have to change I the know. name again. That's funny rebranding. You know, I'm yeah. wondering like when the Republican <laughs> the, the Republican Party are going to change their name to something. They've got some. Oh, there you go. <laughs> right. Yep. So. Uh, uh, bow tie libertarians. Uh, I looked at the Von Mises Institute and they have a wiki. And, mm-hmm. you know, I figured there'd be like a six page article about the freedom fiends and how great they are with, you know, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful quotes about liberty. Like, you know, the, the fabulous quote about liberty that I made, like, uh, I want to have an uncircumcised wolf living in my yard. I mean, that's important stuff and the kids need to know. <laughs> the only mention of us on, on the Von Mises Institute wiki is in the Silver Dime Card article we're mentioned in passing as a list ah, of uh, ah. people that there are Silver Dime Cards for. So uh, I think someone should go on there and add a decent Freedom Fiends and Guns and Weed the Road to Freedom uh, entry. Okay, okay. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it would especially help if it was a student at Von Mises Institute or if it's someone who regularly has already updated the wiki. That usually works best with wikis. But uh, Although damn, we that's... have a completely different feel. I mean, like the Institute is like Libertarian University and we're like the parties down the street <laughs> on West Campus. We're, we're the frat party or something. I know. We're like the, you know, we're standing at the edge of the parking lot when the people come out of out of class going, Psst, hey, kid, want to buy some <laughs> crocodile <laughs> and liberty? <laughs> yeah, crocodile liberty baby or liberty branded crocodile. Yeah, 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 it'd be like it'd be it'd be a tablet that has like uh Ludwig von Mises on it on a tablet of, <laughs> of yeah. You know, of LSD Rothbard with a little bow tie on the back. <laughs> people people always used to uh uh LSD they you know a lot of it was on paper on blotter mm-hmm. paper yeah, and yeah. people would print all sorts of things on it and it was kind of like branding. They still do, I guess. I don't know. But you know, so some of them were weird. Like, you know, a lot of them were like peace and love and unicorns and stuff. But one was Ozzy Osbourne. And I'm like, I don't think I'd want to take any Ozzy Osbourne acid. That sounds like a weird <laughs> right, trip. Right. You know, and then at, some at least of them, lock up all your small pets and animals before you do that one. You know, and then some of them, like I've seen in, in books and stuff and in websites, like, you know, some one's like a gun pointed at your face. You know, I don't know if that's mm. DEA acid or what, but, you know, who knows. But yeah, there should be some bow tie crocodile. With with yeah. <laughs> with Murray Rothbard on one side, no, just a bow tie well, on the back. Well, um, you know, I think the Ludwig von Mises Institute or Mises dot org they sell like in their store they sell bow ties with like little uh, Ludwig von Mises crests and stuff. Really? And really? I remember I used to, uh, yeah, I used to really want to buy a bow tie from them and be like wear wear it on air and be like, yeah, wow. you don't know what this is because that's weird though because bow ties are also associated with black nationalism. Black nationalism, like Malcolm X and stuff. Yeah, really. Yeah, because Malcolm X. Oh, yeah, well, I, I guess. Yeah, because the what's yeah, what's the right. group now? They all wear bow ties. What are they called? Black Panthers. Nah, Black Panthers. Ma- Nation, like, Nation of Islam. Yeah, Nation of Islam. Yeah, they all wear bow ties. Yeah, I not all, right. but a lot of them do. Yeah. Hmm. I guess the bow tie is just so different from a traditional tie. So it's saying, hey, I'm still gonna wear a tie, but it's gonna be a different tie. Yeah. Yeah. Although it's still a tie. And you're still wearing a suit. Yeah. Although I, I, I like to wear suits and ties. I know. Yeah, you like to be in drag for the state. For the you man. Be in drag for the state. Yeah. You dress <laughs> up and go like, I'm a pretty statist. <laughs> <laughs> wearing your three piece suit. Oh man. I don't even know. Shooting how to crocodile to that. in front of a mirror alone in a room, but like you feel like you're in there with three other chicks. Other yeah, chicks. Yeah. yeah. Crying while I'm staring at an American flag. <laughs> so, Breaking Bad. I still maintain that Mike's not dead. We assume it was Mike's body in the trunk, but we never saw the face. Oh, wait. Should I have had a spoiler alert there? Uh, I plugged my ears and was going la, 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 la. I feel head. like there's no spoiler alerts anymore unless it's a movie. You know, if it's episodic stuff, it's like, 
you know, I mean, that's so part many, of the fun is to conjecture about what happened and what well, is ha- and, currently you know, happening. And there's so many different delivery methods. Like, you know, if you're watching it on Netflix, you're still in season three, you know, but if you're if you're on the on the torrents, you're. Hello, what happened? Yep, I'm here. It sound, sounded like a cord almost got unplugged there. Yeah, I talked about torrents and the central scrutinizer cut me it off. Was, it was literally for like a split second. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, but yeah. Uh, in related news, I finally did get Netflix. Yay, so we can start Yay. reviewing the same shit. All right, then I got to review something from, from Netflix, or I'll just say it's great, and then you can go watch it. I finally watched Objectified, which is part three of Gary Huswit's design trilogy. Um, You should watch it. It's the one that has, you know, it's it's... Design, Objectified is about industrial design. Um, Helvetica is about graphic design and particularly about that font. And um, there's one about city planning. You should watch all of them. They're really good. Yeah. Yeah. Although somebody said uh, in the comments they watched Helvetica and said it was the most boring hour and a half they'd ever seen or something about that. Yeah, effect. but that was a guy that like loves gun training films and nothing else, wasn't it? Okay. I don't know. Um, but I'm just pulling his chain. I don't remember who it was, but <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what what's the gist of Objectified again? It's just about. Damn, I need a new mic. Did you hit, did you hit the mic again? <laughs> Coming in. Hitting the mic. Yeah. Uh, I gotta replace. Do, this do you want to take a break and adjust it and cut yeah. off that last the yeah. last bit with all the? Okay. No, I want to leave it in. It's part of the process. <laughs> right. It's good for now, man. If I don't touch it, if I don't touch it, we're good. Okay, okay. so um, I have some more news about or or a fact about films. That's oh, you want to know about Objectified? No, go watch it, and then we'll go watch the trilogy, and then we'll review them together. Oh wow! So mm-hmm. I say I have Netflix, and all of a sudden I'm I'm obligated to watch three <laughs> You're getting movies. assignments. <laughs> no, I have watch the trilogy watch, to watch. watch five minutes of one of the movies, and if you don't love okay. it. Then we'll okay. talk about what's wrong with you on the cast. <laughs> You'll do some attack therapy on me. Yeah. I also want to say that somebody, I don't know who, put up um, torrents of DVD ISOs of two of my movies, uh, the Hebert Selby movie and DIY or Die. Uh, and that will be tonight on the, uh, about, you know, a little after this comes out. If you look on the uh, twitter.com slash fiend torrents, there'll be links to the magnet links for that. Yay. Which movies again? The Hubert Selby Jr. It'll Be Better Tomorrow movie and ah, the excellent. DIY or Die How to Survive as an Independent Artist movie. Which was your first film. Yeah, and there's also The Guns and Weed, The Road to Freedom is up there too. So if you want to be a Michael Dean completist and have DVD ISOs, which is basically you can burn a DVD from that that is the DVD. I mean, it's perfect. It's got all the chapters, all the menus, all the DVD extras. It's full quality. Basically, with most um, editing program, I mean, most DVD bro- burning programs, have the ability to convert, a, you know, really just you import just, the ISO. No, you just double click on the ISO and it usually opens up your DVD burning program. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. Nice. If not, you can download free things that do. Yeah. Yeah. I think I have Sorry. ultra ISO or something to that effect. Um, yeah. Which you can also make ISOs with that. Basically, an ISO is just a literal facsimile image. of of the image yeah. that's on the CD. So yeah, I like I have an ISO uh, making program that I really like because it only does one thing. It does it really well. It makes ISOs and then makes DVDs from ISOs, and it's like forty two k. I mean, you can email it to somebody. Nice. nice. Should I email it to you? Yeah, or email you? it to me. I'll do it right now. Because I because I have I have ultra ISO and I find it to be clunky and too big. For what it is, like there's too many options. It's like, is it was this tailored to burn DVDs? Was it tailored to be an ISO program? Uh, but if something's simple, as simple as you say it is, go ahead and email it to me. Yeah, I'm looking for it. Yeah. I can't remember the name of it, but uh, yeah, yeah, excellent. Yeah. Any other um, news you can use or tech stuff, or should we yeah, jump wanted, into our I topic? Wanted, for the I wanted. Day? Well, I wanted to talk about um, quota pictures. Oh yeah, I did actually. Read Quota up pictures on that. or how socialism made England the laughing stock of the film world <laughs> in 1920s. Basically, uh, and and I was watching this documentary about this famous or this really celebrated cinematographer who'd worked on a lot of great films, including Hitchcock and a bunch of other stuff. And but he got his start in quota pictures and I was like quota pictures I gotta look that up it sounds socialist and it is um, yeah. basically England in the 1920s was really disgusted by the well, politicians there were disgusted by the fact that you know 99.9% of the films being shown in England were made in Hollywood 
they were jealous, basically. Right. So yeah. instead of, you know, allowing free market and, you know, not regulating things to allow England to have a, a film industry, they decided to force one, which was uh, they made a law that 20% of all films shown in England had to be current, you know, like within the last year and made in England. Uh, so that meant that suddenly they had to make films to fulfill that law. And mm -hmm. the price was paid partly by the government and partly by film distributors who really didn't like the idea. So all of a sudden they were churning out dozens per week of really horrible films just to say, we got another film, we got another film, we got another film. And because it's guaranteed to sell. Somebody's yeah, going to have to yeah, buy it because of the quota. Yeah. And England went from being kind of nobody in the film world to being a laughing stock, which is far worse, you know? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's completely ridiculous. And it goes to show you, if if you get jealous that another country has a better film industry than yours, why don't you just go make your own films? Because then you'll actually have to work hard on them and make them high quality instead of forcing uh, people at gunpoint to play whatever crappy films they that the studios make just because the distributors are going to be forced to buy them. Yeah. So I'm sending you this ISO creator. It's 52K and it's called LC ISO creator. So I'm okay. stealing time from the fiends to send it to you. Okay. It'll probably get, didn't you have a thing where like dot exes don't come through to you? And no, is that, it was them? that, it was a specific program. Everyone okay. else, every other All right. has worked fine. Okay. If it doesn't, I'll put it, uh, I'll send it to you some secret way, like through okay. our, uh, encrypted uh we have a little new way of communicating now yeah. using off the record otr uh chat which is kind of looks like old aol chat but uh and it's based on it but it's secure we like it it's good yeah it's worked I'm gonna, so far I'm, I'm doing an interview at length about that and other security stuff soon my my third or fourth my fourth hacker interview coming up on the gumbos in the next couple of weeks well, speaking uh, of interviews and movies, you also told me you'll be uh, interviewing what is the director, the of, Gray director State? of Gray State. Gray State, which is um, okay. tonight I'm interviewing him, comes out in two weeks. Uh, Gray State is a really cool looking documentary. It's only at the trailer stage right now or extended trailer. Um, it looks like uh, kind of like Red Dawn. I mean, it's, you know, but it's basically the, the enemy that American citizens are having to fight against is FEMA instead of Russia, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> and it, it looks incredibly well made for an indie movie. And generally when people say, I need money to get my movie made, I say, go make it cheap like I do. But this guy, this couldn't be made really, really cheap. I mean, this looks like a Hollywood production. It's amazing. And uh, it's a really unique subject matter that couldn't get made this way in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Okay. I'll have to check out the trailer. I'm actually on the website right now, and it does look really high quality and interesting. I kind of want to see it. It really and does. I, I think this kind of future fiction is really really good to the movement because, like you said, you have to visualize the state uh, or visualize, visualize lib pair. I think it's also important to visualize the terrors that could come before well, lib pair. Well, you know, they said in 1984, if you want a vision of the future – visualize a boot stomping a human face forever this movie actually visualizes it for you <laughs> there you go there you go excellent it's well, gonna um, be the, it's gonna be the feel good hit of 2013 <laughs> no i'm gonna ask him you know he asked me do you want to interview me or do you want to interview one of the the actors and i'm like i want to interview you man i want to interview the director you know i think i think that people are asking to interview the actors more so they're used to that but i'm like mm -hmm. i don't care i don't care what what talking props have to say i want to talk to the guy who came up with this i also want to talk to him about the technology he's using because i'm pretty sure he's using red you know those really uh -huh. really high def super cameras. expensive yeah. cameras and i definitely want to ask him some questions about that <laughs> You're listening to the Freedom Fiends podcast. Freedom Fiends is now available for 24-7 streaming to your iPhone, Android phone, or other chromed robot turd. Click on the streaming audio link on freedomfiends.com. That's F-R-E-E-D-O-M-F-E-E-N-S dot com. Uh, 
Hi, I'm Michael Dean from the Freedom Fiends, and like you, I'm concerned with privacy on the internet. The electronic police state is strangling our previous protections, and the central scrutinizer is trying to squint into all areas of our lives. That's why smart people surf the net with a VPN or virtual private network. I use a VPN from Bola VPN. Bola VPN has your utmost security in mind and will allow you to surf, email, and do other computing tasks without leaving a trail of breadcrumbs across the internet. Unlike many other VPN providers, Bola VPN doesn't log traffic. With Bola VPN, you can change your apparent location or disappear completely. Bola VPN has been around since 2007, which is OG in the VPN world. Bola VPN is easy to install and configure. Best of all, it can be had for less than 25 cents a day, which is a small price to pay for this much security. And if you open a support ticket saying you heard about them through the Freedom Fiends, they'll add three extra days free. That's Bola VPN at B O L E H V P N dot net. You've read books, attended lectures, and you know the Constitution well enough to know it's a well crafted blueprint to create an ever increasing federal empire. But there's still one thing missing buttons. <clears throat> Freedom Fiends now has buttons. We have Freedom Fiends, Anarchy Gumbo, and two designs for Guns and Weed the Road to Freedom. Wear them with pride. Use them to start conversations with statists. It's only $6 for four buttons, including shipping. Go to freedomfiends.com and click on the link at the top that says buttons. Yeah. So, you haven't seen Boardwalk Empire yet? No, I have not gotten a chance Man. to yet. Man. You Man. And you and your life. You and your endless <laughs> vacations. You have it though, right? Uh, no, like I said, I still got about 20%. I haven't started my BitTorrent program up since I got home. Start we had now. another show to watch, which I won't say the name of it because it's kind of a guilty pleasure, and it's a show my wife's been wanting to watch. What but is it? What is it? I'm not, I'm not going to say it on air. And we, we finished it uh, finally. So um, I have an opportunity to start watching Boardwalk Empire, but I haven't done it yet. Well, I wanted to name drop something about it. Was uh, When we first started watching it, we were like, you know, the opening credit says Steve Buscemi standing in, uh, standing at the edge of the ocean while all these bottles of alcohol float in, you know, and you're mm -hmm. kind of like, hmm, what's going to happen? And uh, the music playing kicks ass. And I was like, God, what is this music? It sounds kind of 70s, but you can tell it's modern. Uh huh. And I looked it up and it's, uh, it's straight up and down by the Brian Jonestown Massacre. I know those guys pretty well. Oh, really? Yeah. From oh, San Francisco sweet. and LA. Uh, and I'm, I'm really envious about it. Not, not because like it's a success and they're probably making money on it. Like they've been successful in their own way for a long time. And I know people who are a lot more successful, but I've always really wanted to have some music I use made used in somebody else's really cool movie or TV show. So I'm envious about that. <laughs> I see. And why is that? Because it, it will bring you a whole new audience that you didn't have before or because it shows that some other artists saw the feeling that your work can bring to their own work? Uh, no, it's the first thing. And then also, um, I would like to be a part of something like that. Ah, okay. It would be more self-satisfaction than somebody has, you know, Right, Ble right, blessed me like the Pope. Uh, yeah. Right, right. But the song actually really sounds a lot like a couple other songs. One is "Dear Mr. Fantasy" by Traffic, and one is "Season of the Witch" by Donovan. So okay. if you know those songs, if you know those songs, you'll know what I mean. I did listen to "Dear Mr. Fantasy" and did enjoy it thoroughly. It's a good tune, man. It's a good yeah. tune. That's a good band. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Traffic, all these, man. All this OG stuff, man. Old, old people music. <laughs> <laughs> so. Let's see. I was going to say, uh, DJ met Neil Armstrong when she was a teenager. Oh, uh, really? Cool. Yeah, he died recently. What was yep. he like? Or what did she remember of him? Just some man. <laughs> just, just some guy that came by. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing she was walked on the moon. When she grew up in, in Houston, and, you know, a lot of people yeah. were involved in NASA. So, uh, right. You know, was this pre moon or post moon? Uh, I think it was post moon. It was. Um, okay. Oh, yeah, because 69, yeah, she was like 10 in 69 when that happened. And okay. this was over at her boyfriend's house when she was 16 or 17. Her the, her boyfriend's father was a mathematician for NASA and was friends with Neil uh, Armstrong. Yeah. Uh, I, see. I see. So did you read this, A Cry to Nationalize Facebook? Yeah, yeah, it was completely ridiculous. Uh, it was on Slate. 
and I don't know where the guy gets off thinking that this would be a good idea. And he says in the, in the intro, yeah, this, this may sound crazy, but I'm going to give you some reasons why it's not. Uh, but they're all reasons why he is crazy. So, Well, he believed that Facebook's privacy uh, ideas, privacy, what's the word? Privacy policies, policy. Mm-hmm. You know, were, weren't were, adequate. Were, weren't and, and adequate. Holes in them. So we needed the government to control Facebook so it would have better privacy. <laughs> Yeah, it made no sense. Not only that, he also complained about how the privacy policy was was vague and untransparent. And so again, <laughs> why would you let the government control that? They're about as vague and untransparent as any organization I've ever dealt with. That's like saying somebody's stealing packs of gum at the local supermarket. We should have the supermarket run by the mafia, and that'll never happen again. <laughs> there won't be any gum stolen in that supermarket. Right, right. Crime will disappear if the mafia runs that supermarket. Yeah. Well, he's upset that, that people are worried that their um, their information gets sold to corporations and nobody knows who they get sold to. But... Would you rather have the government looking at every bit of information about you and knowing every detail? Well, they of your already life are where you're at. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that, they, that's another thing. They Facebook already already, are. already is nationalized right. in a way, right. but and already whenever the government asks the corporations for information, uh, they're more than happy to bend over backwards to give that information to the government. Well, did you hear that Apple just patented a technology to be able to shut off iPhones in a particular area using a radio signal? Ooh. No, yeah. that's horrible. I which, didn't hear about which, that. Which wouldn't just cut off their ability to like work as a phone, but it would cut off their ability to like work as a video camera, filming cops or whatever. Oh, know? really? Yeah. So it, it would even kill all the offline stuff. Yeah. So it's not, you know, it's not even just they're complying with something. I think that they're coming up with services they can sell to the to governments that will intrude on people. Right, right. A new market for, or not a new market, but another market for them to expand into. <laughs> People are going to have to go back to like fil- filming police abuse with like Super 8 cameras and reel to reel portable tape recorders. <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> well, I also did, speaking of Apple, um, there was a thing I saw today too that some hackers uh, hacked into an FBI laptop or database or something and found um, millions of iTunes accounts that they'd been looking into and also Apple some acronym like UDU information as well for Wait, their why would the why would the FBI want to know which songs you're listening to? I mean, your guess is as good as mine, but it's not just songs. I mean, iTunes also movies, sells books, books movies, yeah. everything. Yeah. They want to TV know if, shows. They want to know if you've been re- watching that movie about the Red Army faction that I'm so fond of. Yeah. <laughs> they <haven't watched laughs> they, they want to see how high you rate uh stuff by the Dead Kennedys. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there you go. Or, they want to know or, or podcast. I mean, podcast. Yeah, all go. my all my podcasts. Come what am from I thinking? ITunes. Like, yeah, that's where. Yeah, duh. Oh. Derp. <laughs> Excuse me, I was laughing. There's a. But, but it seemed like it was information that the FBI would have had to request from Apple in some way. Yeah. Uh, according to to the, what the hackers were looking at. Wow. Yeah. Um. You know, I have some news you can use about app about iTunes too. Uh, if you're still using it after that last segment, um, <laughs> when you if you're subscribed to one of our podcasts through iTunes, they take about a day to upload to update and be listed in there after they post, but they're still downloadable in iTunes immediately. All you have to do is right click on the name of the podcast and put update. Go to update podcast, and they'll download immediately if they're new. Yeah, yeah. I usually yeah. Uh, get them right on time. I just hit refresh. And then I, I can. There's a little drop down. You can open up the name of the podcast, and if there are episodes you missed, you can. They'll be grayed out, and you can double click on those. Ah, uh, yeah. And I also, um, I always right click on the name of the podcast and check do not auto delete. And then sometimes uh. you have to do that on individual episodes too, because I iTunes likes to do too much for you and think it's cleaning house for you and delete and an episode after you've listened to it. And sometimes. It does it even if you listen to half of it and stop, and you're going to go back and listen later. If you update iTunes between then, it'll delete it. Yeah. That's one of the reasons I was really reluctant to ever do iTunes. I was I was like, I don't want a program that's going to you know 
t- make all these decisions for me. And I know you can probably turn most of them off, but I do. I always I do. wanted just like like a thing that I could just see what files I have and drag and drop them myself and make all the decisions myself. Um, but I'm also lazy, so uh, once I got used to iTunes, I was like, yeah, whatever, let it do its thing. Speaking of Apple and its tyranny. Um, <laughs> there's an article on Yahoo. Want to track U.S. drone strikes? There ah. will apparently never be an app for that. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. There's an app um, titled Drones Plus that shows you where the U.S. has drones done drone, drone strikes around the world that week. And uh, Apple banned it uh, because they considered it objectionable and crude content. Yes, knowing who your taxes kill would be objectionable and crude. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought that that was a little ironic of them to call it that. You know, you could jailbreak the iPhone and use it from Android, and you could do it on an Android phone anyway. I think Steve well, Jobs... Well, the other thing was it, it was all public information, too, so you could probably just look it up. Um, yeah, but people like it at their fingertips. And, you know, I, I think that Steve Jobs didn't hate Android because he felt it copied some of Apple's OS. I think he hated Android because he didn't have control of the content. Do you think he was? I mean, he was I a control he, he freak, a control freak in a lot of yeah. ways. And people, I've heard people say he's libertarian because he did things like you know wouldn't wouldn't have a license plate. Um, yeah. he was not libertarian at all. He was incredibly he, he's libertarian IP. for himself. He just didn't. He wanted to be the one in control instead. Yeah, of the state. and he didn't really take care of business either. You know, like he was a billionaire, and his ex wife was asking for eighteen thousand dollars one time payment for child support. And a DNA test had proved it was his kid, and he's like, I, I don't know you nothing. You know, which I guess someone could say is is libertarian compliant, but maybe not, and it just wasn't a good guy thing to do. Finally, his board of directors made him pay it because he was about to be interviewed in Time magazine. <laughs> okay, okay. So he did pay it eventually. Yeah, I mean, he broke law. He did... When he was starting out, he, he first made money doing computing stuff, selling little boxes that could get you free phone calls. You know, he was hacking an IP system, that intellectual property system back in the day. That's yeah. how he financed Apple computers. But uh-huh. uh, then later he got really upset when other people did it. You know, that's kind of a common thing too. Like the drummer in... Um, the drummer in Metallica. You know, Metallica went out, sued their fans for sharing their stuff on Bitcoin. Lars. Yeah. And on their first record, or not their first record, they had this band called like Back to the Garage or Garage Days or something. It's all cover songs, like recorded real fast and dirty after they'd become rock stars. And like uh-huh. the liner notes in it, and this is right before the BitTorrent thing, the, the liner notes in it, Lars wrote them and he's like, yeah, I remember when we were starving and sleeping on each other's floors and, you know, sharing one sandwich and... We would stay up all night making cassette copies of, you know, mixtapes of each other's of each other's record collections. Yeah, that's the same thing as yeah. download sharing yeah. music online. It's just it's easier to do it online. Online makes everything easier. So don't feel so singled out, butthole. Yeah, butthole. All right. All right. I think we're done with the pregame show here. <laughs> let's get into bitching about Lars and Metallica. Let's, let's get into Nancy Reagan and bitch about her. So, drug rehab in the state, part 2 of 2. Part two, yes. Where we last left you, we were talking about uh, Nancy Reagan's "Just Say No" campaign. And do you do you have any personal stories from that era, Michael? Um, do you remember that still? I was in 1981. Let's see. I was let's see, 64, 74, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I was 17. I got kicked out of high school that year and went to college, and I didn't have a TV. I was aware of it. Um, I don't think they tried it at our college. They There were rumblings of it in my school right before I got kicked out in my boarding school. Um, mm-hmm. Teachers had mentioned it or whatever. I really, you know, I was busy getting drunk and smoking weed. I, d- I didn't have a TV. I didn't notice. <laughs> you were too busy saying yes. I was too busy saying yes to care about she or her saying no. Yeah. Well, here's the other thing. Um Implicit in just say no is in parentheses. I feel like when you read it is a or else or will right? kill you. Yeah, yeah, or else because uh, you know as as when this rolled out, so did the zero tolerance campaign, which we talked about. What a horrible phrase, zero tolerance. Like we are not going to be tolerant of anything. We're going to treat everybody equally horrible, horribly. Yeah. And yeah. uh, around that, or a little bit after that time, in 83 was when D.A.R.E. started. Well, before that, you skipped the Betty Ford Clinic opens. Yeah, I've been, I, I skip around to what was well, relevant to me. But that's but- relevant to me, too, because 
you know, while this one first lady, Nancy Reagan, was saying, just say no or else, the other, you know, Ford's wife had a drug addiction and started a high dollar rehab in her name or someone started it with her cooperation. And, you know, I mean, there's kind of the thing of, there's always kind of been the thing of redemption of like, if you forsake drugs forever and get into recovery, you're okay to go on national television and talk about, you know, your lowest point. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's kind of got this like Baptist redemption thing to it, I think, you know, like this, born uh, again, being this, born again. The, the state has scrubbed you clean in prison or something. <laughs> You've been baptized by the yeah. state. Also in 1982, yeah. Cocaine Anonymous was founded, which, uh, interestingly, <laughs> Cocaine Anonymous was, um, basically a bunch of rich people who didn't want to go to NA meetings. And then Cocaine Anonymous got really upset in 87 or 88 when crackheads started coming into Cocaine Anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. They're too ghetto for us. We're, we're yeah. the Cokeheads. We're yeah. a little bit. I mean, you know, a Cocaine that. Anonymous share is like, yes. And then I hit bottom. I had to sell one of my three BMWs, you know. <laughs> right, right. I couldn't add that new wing to my mansion. Yeah, yeah, my yeah. my uh, I don't know a whole lot about the Betty Ford Clinic. I guess that's why I just skipped it over. But I do remember a great line in a uh, tribe called Quest song where Q-Tip says, uh, "Tonight is the night I get my groove on steady and get my drink on with that Ford name, Betty." <laughs> yeah, which, which I, I thought and, was clever. You know, we're we're skipping the fact that she did a photo op of herself in South Central Los Angeles on a tank. Like oh, really? We like we're going to war we're gonna with the drug dealers. We're gonna bulldoze your house. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna bulldoze. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I feel like one of the reasons the state loves the drug war so much is because uh, it's another great scapegoat for them to to have uh, a war to fight that they can they can blame all of the ills of the world on these drug dealers and the fact that they don't have enough power to fight the drug dealers and then the the idiotic give them that power and cede that power to them and also believe and buy the line that the problem isn't the state the problem is these drug addicts yeah when actually if drugs were legal and we've said this before we'll say it again you know uh Cartel members, cartel leaders, you know, would be, we'll be picking grow, bananas, pick, picking bananas or growing bananas. Although there is a lot of statism and war involved in bananas. If you know about the history of the banana republics, I mean, uh, there have been wars fought basically by the military for United States Corporation. United Fruit, I think, was one of them, you know. Right. You know and I think they that? have some role in, in the Hawaiian, uh, not independence because they're not really the opposite. independent. The Stealing them, making them a state. Yeah. Yes, yeah. was was Dole's banana plantation on um one of the islands that I could see from my hotel room window when I was visiting Hawaii. Um, interestingly though, now that Hawaii is part of America and subject to minimum wage laws, it became too expensive for Dole to keep their banana plantation there. So I think they've since moved it to the Philippines or something like that, some place yeah. where they don't have to follow the minimum wage laws. Yeah. So what Not that happened? minimum wage laws are good, but that's another discussion, and we've had that discussion before. What else happened in 1983? 83, uh, let's see. I don't have the list. I just have my notes on it. So I skipped over the D.A.R.E. Pro, uh, everything but the well, D.A.R.E. Well, 1983, program. the Colombian Medellin Mafia begins to do business in the United States, uh, which I covered a lot of before on um, – on uh, when I was reviewing that movie about the drug trade in Miami. And uh, interestingly, like a woman that was a big player in that and in that movie, uh, Graciela, somebody who's like the, the grandmother of, of cocaine, they called her. She's now about, well, she was murdered this week. That's kind of interesting news. She was murdered in a drive by shooting and she'd been uh, out of the business for a long time. And, you know, they want to, they blame it on, rival cartels but she was out of the business and retired i i think there was a state and, behind and it and maybe think, thinking of some kind of memoirs or book deal <laughs> yeah i think there was a state behind it i think there was like a you know okay enough times passed no one will really notice this you know let's do it was it i mean is it obvious it was some kind of murder it was or murder it's it obviously murder it was a drive-by shooting when she was coming out of a deli but uh uh, uh you know, who knows who did it? They say it was the cartels. And, you know, there's an interesting thing this week I heard on Free Talk Live was in, uh, in Brazil this week, there were, there were 21 murders all connected to local elections, mayor and city council. Mayor and city council. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, somebody's yeah. protecting some kind of side deal. Apparently. Yeah. 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 The state is just violence incarnate. And that's a good summation of that. Yep. Wow. Yep. Um, although, uh, to get back to our sort of history here, um, dare, do you dare. I was going to talk about Daria. Do you have any experience with Dare? Did your little girl go to Dare, and do you remember that? She did, uh, and she had a Dare t-shirt. She had two of them, and she actually, I said, can I have one? And I wore it ironically while being a heroin addict. <laughs> okay, okay, excellent. Yeah, they didn't have Dare when I was a kid. I, I missed Just Say Nancy by two minutes, and uh, but I did tell you that we had one narcotics. We Well, I call him a narc. He was actually... A police officer, but he was the guy in charge of drugs in our little mm-hmm. town of Westfield, New York. And I had a crush on his daughter. And, um, but they, when I was like in eighth grade, they came in, he would come into our school for every, every year for the new class, mm-hmm. eighth grade and, uh, you know, give him lectures. So that was kind of the proto dare, but, uh, okay. Okay. you know, it wasn't a federally mandated, funded, organized thing like dare. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember us buying dare at all. Anybody in my, I think it was sixth grade classroom. Um, we all just thought it was a joke. Uh, and they gave us this this workbook, and the workbook made it seem like a joke. Like it was – they didn't really make any arguments about it. It all seemed like BS, like just another school thing. Um, and so it actually, I think, did the opposite effect because um, we it wasn't really a contest, but we would uh, deface our dare books and draw like needles <laughs> going into the arms of the dare characters and joints in their mouths. And uh, it all was just a, a way for us to talk about drugs and the different drugs drugs we had done and, and wanted to do <laughs> <laughs> so um do you have any more notes for the 80s here or you want to jump to the 90s uh yeah i think something important happened the year i was born um 1984 the national minimum drinking age act um where the state the fed the feds wanted to raise the, the minimum drinking age to 21 instead of 18 which it was I 18 mean, in some states and 21 in others i told you right I live 10 miles from the border of Pennsylvania, and... You guys would drive over? The, well, my older sister's friends would. Okay, okay. For a beer run and bring it back, or you guys would go there and, like, party? I don't know what they did, but I know that that was something discussed with, okay. you know, clucking of tongues in my house by my, <laughs> by my parents. Yeah, yeah. Well, I lived uh, in Texas and in Louisiana. Well, I guess it had stopped by the time I was 18. But um, in Louisiana, they held on to the 18 age for a long time because in Louisiana, drinking is kind of a big, big business. I mean, people go to New Orleans and they party and there's Mardi Gras and drinking is important. I mean, you can buy liquor. You can buy Jack Daniels at a gas station and have it poured into a styrofoam cup with ice. Um, And I think Louisiana held out for maybe it was the longest. I'm not 100 percent sure on that. Probably because it's such a tourist thing. Right, one of the long, if not the longest running, eighteen age, then definitely up there. Yeah. And the state would withhold highway funds, right? So they wouldn't give you federal highway funds. And so um, it's anecdotal that whenever you drive to Louisiana, you complain about the roads being crappy because Louisiana didn't change <laughs> with everybody else. Which is, you know, just another indication of the state having its fingers in the other states' thing. You know, if you ever want to enforce state rights. The Tenth Amendment, you can't because even if you can, the federal government is going to screw you in some other way. So right. being dependent always creates vulnerabilities. Oh, and, uh, completely in every in every situation, not yeah. just government. Um, it's also a, an example of how the state uses roads to um, roads. Guess, bri- bribe you or blackmail you into into doing their bidding. They, yeah. they make you believe that roads are the most amazing thing in the world, and they're the only providers of roads. You cannot get yep. roads without us, people. For more on this, watch Boardwalk Empire, which is a bunch of politicians who are in their own mafia <laughs> buying up all the land where they know the swamp land, where they know the roads are going to go in New Jersey so they can sell them for 100 times as much. Yeah. <laughs> sell the land for 100 times as much. Oh, they they love the, the road thing, don't they? All of yep. them. Yeah, but our hero Nookie gets screwed over by his wife on that. Would this be a deal breaker? I mean, a spoiler? Um... I she's, don't know, man. she's pissed off at him and he's he's facing federal time he signs his assets over to his wife who's a good catholic woman and uh you know she's supposed to sign him back after he's cleared and he's cleared and you know, she by, doesn't care by, by bribing some judges and murdering some witnesses he's cleared and uh 
Yeah, she signs it over to the church, man. Signs the land over to the church for the roads. Nice. Well, does he kill her? I don't know. That's where the last set, it ends. It starts up again uh, in two weeks. Oh, okay. Probably not, but he's not going to be very happy. No. <laughs> so a bunch of other stuff happened in the 80s and 90s of laws, like minimum sentencing, minimum punishment. Man- man- mandatory minimum sentencing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which is a completely horrible thing. And um, when Randy England was talking to us, I brought that up, uh, you know, things should be on a more case-by-case uh, basis than not. And he said, well, yeah, but usually people de facto uh, end up ruling the same way on things, or juries can think in similar ways if a standard is built anarchically. But when the state does something like mandatory minimum sentencing, then the judge is forced, even if, if the facts of the case uh, would have a reasonable person to believe that this person shouldn't go to jail for life or for 10 years or for 15 years, uh, the judge's hands are tied. Yeah. And he can also use that as an excuse. I mean, he can My use that as a yeah. yeah. I mean, how can how can people really think the state has your best interest at heart when they don't these laws, these mandatory minimum sentences are written by politicians who don't have personal experience with with you as the defendant or or even the person who was wronged. And I, I feel like it's a good example that um the state can do no good with these laws. I see drug laws as being very much a parallel with um, former sodomy laws. You know, like, mm-hmm. pretty much most people now accept, well, homosexuals should, even people that don't think they should be able to marry, like, don't, most people, hopefully, don't think they should be thrown in prison for being gay. Right. In the 50s, they were thrown in prison for being gay, you know? And that's kind of where drug laws are now. They're like, everyone's agreeing that something that, you know, isn't really a crime with a victim should be punished like a really serious crime. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And some way more serious than others, like uh, Gene Simmons, the guy from Kiss. That's his name, right? Gene Simmons. Yeah, he wants to kill people. Long tongue, wants to kill them. Kill drug dealers. I really? still say, man, Republican rock musicians are just... It's like, really? Like, yeah, this whole career being, like, scary and, and defiant and, like, you're you're a Republican? That's even squarer than being a, uh, an Obama humming, humping de- Democrat. Uh, Although that's, it is, it's the yeah. same. It is, but it, it, it's a little squarer, man. It Each really is worse is. than the other all the time. Each is worse than the other. And on that, let's take a little uh, sales pitch here. All okay. right. Want to contribute to Liberty but short on cash? You can help the Freedom Fiends without even spending a post-1964 dime. Download uTorrent and start seeding Fiends episodes. Follow twitter.com slash fiendtorrents to grab the past episodes and new ones as they post. Leave your computer on seeding the torrents while you're at work or asleep. The more people seeding the Fiends, the more drone-proof we'll be when the boot comes down. That's twitter.com slash fiendtorrents. You can subscribe to Freedom Fiends via the RSS link on the top right of any page. It's orange. Or you can subscribe via email at the subscribe by email link at the top of the right sidebar on any page. It's a little bit below the search field. You'll need to respond to a one-time confirmation email, but after that, you will only receive an email each time a new episode posts. The Freedom Fiends respect your privacy. We will not spam you and will not sell, rent, or share your email address. And you are free to unsubscribe at any time. All right. So, uh, 1990s, the internet arrives and online recovery support groups and services become commonplace. Hmm. Okay. Um, what they don't mention in this whole list is 21 years later, Silk Road founded allows, <laughs> allows for uh, anonymous drug sales over the internet. <laughs> Although, I mean, it's not ubiquitous yet. I mean, really, it's still just a, a concept. I mean, I it's don't a think... proof of concept. I mean, I think like four people have used it, and one of them is Stacy Litz. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not like well known, well used, well traveled of a road as far as Silk Road is. Although, I mean, as far as you we don't, know, you don't hear anybody talking about it, but but libertarians. St- Stacy getting it. bust and Wired magazine yeah. and politicians who want to ban the internet. Right. Uh, although, as far as we know, Stacy Litz. Getting busted had nothing to do with Silk Road. She got the drugs there. Uh, she got busted because she sold to a stranger. I, I think that she is proof that Silk Road works because she was able to order quant- quantities <laughs> of drugs on it more than right. one time. Yeah, yeah, and and yeah, like you said, Silk Road. It, that's not what they used to track her down. They used traditional Fed goon methods or shoe drug leather goon methods. Shoe leather. 
Yeah. Shoe leather. What do you mean shoe? Le- oh, boots shoe leather is what old cops say when they're bitching about, you know, computer CSI type stuff. They're like, you know, how'd you solve crimes without all these computers back in the day? And they're like, shoe leather, you know, <laughs> walking and talking, asking yeah. questions, yeah, beating people yeah. up, beating people up. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. what you got next on your. Your list here. Uh, I, I would thought, say, interestingly, is 1982 to 1997, drug use among teenagers spikes, which follows a bunch of drug laws. You know, and yep. I think really the drug laws increase drug use. And this has been shown in countries where drugs are legal or decriminalized. Um, because when drugs are illegal, there becomes a, you know, mafia controlled conduit to keep them coming because it's worth it to them when they're legal it's not worth it to them to do that so you outlaw drugs you increase the number of people using drugs yeah and i I think that that may be more true for young people than adults as well uh a if it's a forbidden fruit and also b if um if you have to go to a drug dealer to get something that drug dealers uh likely to have other things to try to get you interested in as he tries to expand his market yeah, I remember in San Francisco when I was doing heroin, um, right about the time I stopped doing heroin, you know, you used to be able to buy, for 20 bucks, you buy a little bag of heroin in a balloon of tar heroin, yeah. which was a quarter gram, roughly, for 20, 25 bucks. Right around the time I stopped, uh, the Mexican drug dealers there stopped selling that and started only selling what's called a one, one in one. And a one in one, was the same balloon, but it had two little baggies in it, and it had half as much heroin in one baggie and cocaine in the other baggie. And mm. like literally, like a lot of heroin addicts were so just into heroin that when this started happening, you could go down to the drug corners and you could find the little baggies, you know, BB size baggies of cocaine. Just laying the, around on the ground. On the ground. Yep. Wow. Yep. But they were trying to get you hooked to, to the other drug. Yeah. And it, yeah. And it wasn't even free samples. It was just like suddenly. Half of what you're paying for was a drug you weren't looking for. Right, right. And there's no real market recourse to that either because right. they're freaking cartel that's monopolized by the government's violence. Right. On, if somebody on the had, whole market, if somebody else had stood on that same corner just selling, you know, the twenty bag, twenty dollar bag, or a quarter gram of heroin, they probably would have been shot. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Because they have the protection of the government. So, yeah. Uh, and not, not only did the drug uh, use spike during the 80s, but uh, also in the 90s to 2000, uh, from 1990 to 2001, uh, drug use among high, uh, drug use increased among high schoolers by 8%. And, um, eight, well, no, it was 8% used weed regularly in 92 and 20% by 2001. So it more than doubled in a little less than 10 years. Yeah. Just, just basic pot. And 1992, Washington, D.C. Mayor Marion Barry is arrested in a drug sting. And that was an FBI sting uh, with a hooker who was in with the FBI. Um, they probably busted her and turned her. And it was in a hotel room, and it was filmed, and there's video of that. You can go on YouTube, and it's him saying, Bitch, set me up! <laughs> and, uh, yeah. you know, I lived in D.C. a few years before that, I lived in San Francisco, then I moved back to D.C. for a summer, and I lived at 15th and Belmont, which is across the street from Malcolm X Park. And as I've said, anywhere in America across the street from Malcolm X Park is not a great neighborhood. <laughs> uh, it was a crack neighborhood, and it was pretty much the summer of crack. It was like 88, 89, mm-hmm. like when it had been there for a couple of years and it was really taking hold. And uh, Marion Barry was the mayor then. And, um, you know, when the mayor's smoking crack, you can expect there's crack on the city streets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would imagine so, yeah. 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 Um, you know, all the other stuff's more recent, and I didn't find too many noteworthy things. Well, there's one that's uh, noteworthy to me is 1995, the FDA approves the use of naltrexone to treat alcoholism. Uh, uh-huh. I was in the study for that through the oh. Haight-Ashbury Detox Clinic. Okay. After, after I got clean off dope, um... Now, you had a lot of studies. I was, man. Well, hey, you know, you got to make a living in San Francisco when you don't want to work. Yeah. Um, this was a, <laughs> this was a, now Trexone is basically very similar to the drug that they give you when you OD. It's an opiate blocker. Mm-hmm. You know, when someone's dying and ODing, uh, they don't shoot you up with adrenaline like in Pulp Fiction. That would kill you in your heart. But uh, they they shoot you up with naltrexone, and if your heart's still beating, it'll it'll bring you it'll bring you out of being OD'd so quickly you'll be dope sick if you're an addict. 
Uh, uh, it just blocks all the receptors in your brain. It's actually used similar to anabuse, which is something they give alcoholics. Uh, you know, you take anabuse every day, and if you drink, you get really sick. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. it's for people that aren't ready for recovery <laughs> but don't want to drink. I mean, it's so potent that, like, even if you use aftershave with alcohol, it'll make you sick. So, um, but now Trexone is, has a kind of similar use other than bringing people back from ODs is a uh, similar thing with addicts. If you take it every day and then you shoot dope, nothing will happen. And it takes about three days of not taking it before you can feel dope. And, um, but it's also, it had some use in uh, supposedly treating alcoholism because it blocked the receptors that had a connection to how alcohol creates pleasure. Mm -hmm. And I was in the study for that. Wow. So it's the drug that makes doing drugs not fun. Yeah, that sounds like a government approved drug to me. <laughs> it does. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Um, the next one I had was in 2010. Do you have any other ones you considered noteworthy or or milestones in the history of the drug war the and or if you're at the rehab? welfare if you're at the welfare thing, I'm I'm with you. Okay, yeah. Well, uh, I also well, did think it was okay. 2010, four of the largest drug busts in history occur. Yeah, that's where I was going to go. Next. Leading to tons of methamphetamine, marijuana, cocaine, and I'm like, how's that drug war working out for you? Did that stop it? You know. Like yeah, the, yeah. the thing they can brag the most about, they can, they can stand on this warehouse full of drugs and say, look what we did in their goon outfits, you know, with their drugs and money they stole. And it's nothing's changed, man. Nothing changed the next, you know, the places were probably dry for half a week and then somebody else or the same people came in and filled the void. Yeah. It's free exactly. market, baby. The void will always be filled as long as the void's there. I mean, the the market is like water. It Find the hole. Flows over everything and <laughs> like, seeps like, into the cracks. Like that rapper dude says in Guns and Weed the Road to Movie. Uh, Guns and Read the Road to oh, Movie. Yeah. yeah. He goes, Find the hole, man. Find the hole. <laughs> Which I thought was cool and kinky. Find the hole. Yeah. Yeah, and it completely works. Um, yeah, in this drug bust, what was it? The in these four drug busts, there was like three hundred and eighteen million dollars worth of drugs, or was it billion? Million. Million. Okay. Still. Yeah. I mean, also just think about all the the money that they steal in in just those actions. And I know a lot of drug dealers maybe didn't acquire that by by the appropriate means and you can't really put a price on what drugs would be in the free market because there's no market pricing mechanism. I think you can. Um can you? I yeah. don't know how accurate it, I mean it's as accurate as, as the Soviets well, trying to figure out. I think a price it would be at least as cheap as the pharmaceutical equivalents are and probably a lot cheaper. You know, I mean uh I've I've had like you know, when I had a broken arm, I got codeine. Uh you know, I had a, I had, I had a like hairline fracture from skateboarding once and they gave me codeine and I went to the store and had it filled and it was generic and I had it and, and it had it filled generically. So, um, and it was $8 for 50 pills. <coughs> What's that a pill? Dude, you got to, uh, mute Sorry. when you cough and yeah. I'm not supposed to point that out, but we are a teaching <laughs> hospital. So the thing about it though, Michael is you can't decide what would be worth it to people if you took away the the illicitness of all the black market drugs you can't decide which people or how many people would decide hey i'd rather take the cocaine than the codeine or the heroin than the codeine or i'd rather smoke pot than go get myself um various cocktails of pharmaceuticals to combat my ms um plus all the recreational users you can't you can't really know what they'd be willing to pay in the absence of of the drug war, I I think it'd be cheaper personally. I think I think all the well, prices would be a lot cheaper, but okay. I don't know what they would be. But but I think this is a, a a decent starting place to figure it out. Okay, like the pharmaceutical drug. Okay, let's say five of those would get you damn high. So uh, it would be eighty cents for a dose of narcotics. It'd be less than eighty cents for a dose of narcotics that would get you really effed up. Okay, instead of twenty bucks on the street corner cut with cocaine you know so yeah. 80 cents and that's from a pharmacy who has all sorts of like hidden costs that involve the government too so instead of 80 cents i think it'd be about 15 cents so i think it'd be about 15 cents to get high on any drug i mean what does alcohol cost you know if you take away the taxes 
if you take away the tax, yeah, that's the other thing. You don't really know what alcohol would cost in a free market system either, because there are tons of taxes. There's um, regulations that people have to jump through. Uh, there's there's um, regulations and monopolies in some states to where you know the alcohol price is increased because the state has a monopoly on selling alcohol and they up the price so they can use it to buy schools and various. I'm, I'm still going like to say I'm, I'm still going to say drugs would all drugs would be eight cents a dose. Okay. I mean, marijuana could be grown industrially at about the same price, you know, that parsley is grown. And what's parsley? Like four dollars a pound in the supermarket, or cilantro, you, you, or something and, like that. Yeah, and you yeah. say, and you say, well, people would be willing to pay more. You can't really say what they'd pay in a free market. I say somebody would undercut them to the point where it would be twenty percent more than what it costs to make. Okay. Okay. You know, I think that's, that that that's could how happen. free market works. Yeah. Um, so okay. So let's bu- let's buy the premise and quit quibbling about theoretical. Eight cents a dose. All drugs would be eight cents a dose, and that's going to be the name of this episode. No, I'm. Uh, <laughs> we've already okay, named so, this episode. So what what does that mean though? Though Let, let's let's accept your premise here and say that all drugs would be eight cents a dose. Um, how do you think that that affects society? Party time, man. <laughs> Party time. <laughs> well. I mean, first of all, what do people say about uh, drug addicts as, as being a big problem? One of the things is, oh, they go break into your car and steal your car stereo. Uh, yeah, uh, that go, wouldn't happen anymore because, you know, like let's say even if you got, you know, a $100 a day heroin habit would now cost you about uh, do- <laughs> $3. $3.20. $3. And 20 cents. So uh, you can panhandle 320 Anybody can do it. <laughs> There'd be no incentive to break into people's houses, man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that, that would be the big thing. Um, hmm. So, the moral of that story, get rid of the state and we'll have cheap drugs for everyone. <laughs> I don't know if that would be an incentive for a lot of statists. <laughs> drugs, yeah. I, I, I think that's going to be, I mean, the name of this episode was supposed to be Dr- Drug Rehab in State Part 2, but I really think I want to call it All Drugs Would Be 8 Cents a Dose. I think that's more <laughs> SEO compliant. and uh, SEO compliant. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. going to bring the, the clicks. Yeah. Okay. How, drug, how Drugs Could Be 8 Cents a Dose or something like that. I'll work on it. So okay. I think we're done with our timeline here. We wanted to get into some real world kind of stuff uh, about some rehabs like Synanon and some things about attack therapy and kind of some spinoffs of the state's involvement and drug rehabs that act like the state and impact training, and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, Synanon. Let's start with Synanon because it's very yeah. interesting and very, very creepy. Synanon was. Uh, um, when did you, it start? Sixties or seventies? Nineteen fifty-eight. Okay, Nineteen fifty-eight. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and. And uh, by the early 60s, it had become an alternative community, attracting people with its emphasis on living a self-examined lifestyle, as aided by group truth-telling sessions that came to be known as the Synanon Game. And it was permanently disbanded in 1989 due to alleged criminal activities, included, including attempted murder, civil legal problems, and federal tax evasion. Right. It sort of morphed into its own sort of approximation of the state. In the yeah. way they they wanted to force you to stay, didn't want you to leave, wanted um, you to marry within the cult. You know, right. they they strongly encouraged you to actually cut off uh, contact with people who were not in Synanon and marry. You know, they'd have dating yeah. dances to get you. They, to- they would want married couples who joined at the time to break up and take new partners, so they could uh, do it within the Synanon paradigm. Uh, men men got creepy. forced vasectomies. Uh, pregnant women were forced to have abortions. Um, critics also, had could, their critics had their arms broken. Yeah, yeah. So uh, um, allegedly, seems, allegedly, right, right. So it seems allegedly. very violent. Did did you have any personal experience with Synanon or Synanon like organizations? No, nah, man. It, well, it was uh, it was completely disbanded by the time I was you know doing getting, drugs, getting heavy into drugs. Okay, okay, okay. Um, and it, it borrows from different, uh, I guess, well, okay. psychological philosophies. I, like- I, got, I, got, I got a connection, though. Synanon okay. also inspired the creation of successful programs such as the Delancey Street Foundation. Uh, I used to do service at Delancey Street in San Francisco. I used to bring in an NA speaker and, uh, and, and bring a meeting there. And it was... Okay. Um, 
it was uh it was a facility for teenage boys and it was all like kids with mostly serious like violent felony records you know i mean i was kind of scared going in there actually but they were uber polite i mean they were um whatever they were doing to those kids was probably really spooky because or you know seemed that way to me because um these look like kids who would probably stab me on the street and Mm. they were so polite and whenever um on the rare occasion that one of them would kind of act up or, you know, do anything that wasn't compliant. Um, the moderator in the room would say something to him. Like it was, it wasn't time out, but it was something like that. And the kid would fold his hands across his knee and look at the floor for the mm-hmm. rest of the hour. Right. Right. Yeah. Sort of reminds me of, um, those afternoon talk shows where they have the boot camp. They have like the troubled teens <laughs> and they, they play like the, the montage of them yelling at their parents and stuff yeah. like that. And then they have some, uh, you know, boot boot camp sergeant come in and yell at them. Yeah. And I feel like it's not really healthy work because what you're doing is you're beating people into submission rather than uh, helping them to create um, a sense of wellness internally that will actually be and I'll, la- and I'll say I'll say one thing from experience with people who've been through things like that because I know people who've been through things like that. A lot of them end up in NA. Um, it may create a compliance for a while that looks like a success but when those people go out and mess up afterwards they do it spectacularly (laughs) Mm, i can imagine because it's all sort of building up in them i'd imagine because what they're doing is they're they're delaying their gratification um because they're almost being forced to um but they're not changing what gratifies them which I feel like is is more the idea behind AA and NA is is change yourself from wanting drugs to gratify you rather than just delay that gratification at somebody else's yelling and insistence. So the founder of Synanon was um, recorded by the the police LAPD saying we're not going to mess with old time turn the other cheek religious postures. Our religious posture is don't mess mess with us. You can get killed dead, literally dead. Those are real threats. There are like wow. there are draining life's blood from they are draining life's blood from us and expecting us to play by their silly rules. We make the rules. I see nothing frightening about it. I'm quite willing to break some lawyer's legs, next break his wife's legs and threaten to cut their children's arm off. That's the end of that lawyer. That is a very satisfactory, humane way of transmitting information. I really wanted, what? I really want an ear in a glass of alcohol on my desk. And then later, shortly after that, that founder Dietrich, the founder of uh, Synanon, did I say Alanon? No, Synanon. We're talking about Synanon. Mm-hmm. Dietrich was arrested while drunk. Okay. This guy who's like, I'll kill people who criticize my method for keeping people sober was later found drunk. That's kind of awesome. Um, wow. He is it almost a, a, a power corrupts kind of thing? I mean, I could see starting a group like this, and maybe even if you have uh, good intentions at the beginning, once you get this sort of cult-like following, uh, it's a lot of power you have over people, especially if your methods are uh, basically brainwashing and forcing people into behaviors that aren't natural to them or aren't initiated by those people. Well, I could see you getting a power trip. That seems to me like... Yeah, my opinion is that that's what happened with the SPLC. You know, they're not a drug rehab, but the Southern Southern Poverty Poverty Law Center Center started out as, you know, kind of a peaceful little like, okay, we're going to catalog hate groups that commit violence. And then it spread into this whole thing of like, you know, giving we classes. We stand in judgment of yeah, who cla- is right and, and who's and, wrong. And, and giving classes to the, pen- and not just opinions, but like policy, like giving classes right. to the Pentagon and giving memos to Department of Homeland Security that they act on saying Fusion that, centers you know, and local police departments yeah, as well. Yeah, saying, saying that, you know, if you if you're a returning soldier who mentions the Constitution and, and you own guns, you should be detained, you know, right? which right. has been happening lately. Right. And the government enabled them by taking these sort of prescriptions and beliefs from the SPLC. And so the SPLC sort of uh, got the message that they were the ones who gets to judge these kinds of things. And I think you're right that that power could have, I mean, obviously has gone to their heads. Well, you want to talk about like, you know, groups getting power and imitating the state. Much of the violence by Synanon had been carried out by a group within Synanon called the Imperial Marines. Mm, mm-hmm. So they had their own so even, army, you know. Right, even basically. taking the the nomenclature of the state mm-hmm. and using the same the same kind of terminology. 
Two yeah. Synanon members placed a de-rattled rattlesnake in the mailbox of attorney Paul Morantz of Pacific Palisades, California. Oh. Morantz had successfully brought a suit on behalf of a woman abducted by Synanon. The snake bit him and almost killed him. De-rattled, so you don't know it's there. You know? Right, right. Yeah, that's just sick. Well, let's go sell some stuff and then come back and talk more about this. Okay. Go, go, freedom fiends. Freedom fiends. Since time began, tyrants have taken aim at personal liberties. Now there's a movie that aims back. The government has no more right to tell us what to put in our bodies than they have to take our guns or tell us what books we can read. Six drug police were eaten by bears while raiding a marijuana farm. On your knees, you dirty hippies! Jesus. On your knees! What's the problem, officer? Today, many cops who enforce pot laws do so only because it provides them with cushy jobs, good benefits, and a chance to push people around. I was an undercover narcotics officer. The drug war is nothing but a farce. The Second Amendment says you gotta keep you and your gat intact. Guns and Weed, The Road to Freedom. A film by Michael W. Dean and Nima Vidati. DVD available now at GunsAndWeed.com or on Amazon. That's GunsAndWeed.com. Makes the perfect gift. Remember, that's GunsAndWeed.com. Yo. Yo. So, right. the, ma- the main bit, other than threatening and murdering and threatening to murder, um, Synodon basically pioneered something called attack therapy, which... Uh, Okay, the definition is it's a controversial type of psychotherapy evolved from ventilation therapy, which that sounds like suffocating you, I don't know. But uh, it involves highly confrontational interaction between patient and therapist or between patient and fellow patients during group therapy in which the patient may be verbally abused, denounced, or humiliated by the therapist or other members of the group. And uh, Synanon, other groups... Uh, employed in large aware large group awareness training which impact training is a form of that and you've had some experience with that yes yeah, yeah. i have my um my ex stepmom was into it and her sister uh, was the one who brought her into it because one of the things about impact training is when you're done with it uh, after they've brainwashed you one of the things they they implore you to do is sign other people up like, go grab your family members and bring your family members here. Pyramid scheme. Cult. I, sort of. And um, my stepmom got whisked away into these impact trainings, uh, which not, were really popular. In, I'm, not, in, I'm not saying it's a cult. I'm saying that is a, an indicator of cults. It, it has some, some very cult-like qualities that you can see um, from, from what people have described, both on the internet and in my own experience, which is secondhand. Um, but my stepmom, she had gone to these things. She was obsessive about telling us about it and, and what it did to, to help her, but she wouldn't ever be specific. Like I'd be like, well, what are some of the things you learned? Uh, what, what are the reasons that I would want to do it? Trying to get her to say, hey, okay, you're trying to sell me on this. Actually sell me on it, but it's all very secretive. Um, so uh-huh. she didn't really want to get into any details um i've actually um looked it up and did a little bit of research um there was a one person who was sort of coming at it from a, a mormon perspective because like i said this this kind of stuff's really popular in utah um and he had some very uh, big problems with it but they were more theological and well this isn't true to heavenly father but i did find um something in a website called uh ripoff report um their motto is by consumers for com- yeah which consumers. is which is kind of like a uh, independent similar to uh better it's business like a use, bureau. user yeah. content based yeah. better business bureau and or consumer reports but all the stuff is written by actual consumers so um not only can you write a note to the business that has ripped you off but you can also let everybody see what has happened to you um and so this is from somebody who was actually 
doing impact trainings and um, decided it was ruining his life and so quit after I think two years. Um, and he sort of shed some light on what actually happens in these things and attack therapy is definitely how I would categorize it where they, they basically beat you into a pulp and then try to remold you in their own image. Um, <clears throat> which, you know, is done from everything from like the Moonies to, you know, any army in the world does the same thing. Right. Right. Yeah, very similar uh, when you read it to, to something that might happen in, in basic training or some type of government program in I'd America say, and, and back in Nazi days and stuff like that. I'd say that AA does it too, but it's a lot more voluntary and less... Uh, but there's a difference between it being introspective yeah, and coming, it, coming externally. AA has you do written exercises with a sponsor to, I wouldn't say break you down to nothing. It's more like um, re-examine a lot of preconceptions you have. Right. That, okay, that well, let, let, me, let me read some of this, um, this not user, <laughs> but this impact trainee. Uh, let me read some of his thoughts from, from going through the various process. He started with something called um, quest training, which I guess is the first part of impact training. He says, when I attended the quest, quest training, it cost $550. Quest consists of four days of mostly intense and degrading activities <laughs> that are designed to teach trainees obedience to the trainer. Once that obedience has been established, the trainers and staff are able to manipulate the trainee's emotions at will. This emotional control is used repeatedly throughout the rest of the series to keep people paying for more training and enrolling their family and friends. After several days of degradation and a final day where the impact trainers begin to espouse the early stages of their religious beliefs, the quest training ends with a quote-unquote graduation and a final activity where all of the quest trainees are either enrolled into the next stage of the training or publicly chastised for selling out. Huh. So I think that's another important thing to consider is, um, you know, not that the profit motive is wrong, but if you're if you're giving somebody this kind of control over you to where they basically beat you up and then and then don't give you any kind of reconciliation until you do what they tell you, they're obviously going to tell you to give us more money. <laughs> And to bring yeah. your friends and family in to bring us more money as well. Um, and more on the abuse factor. He says that uh, he did end up going for the second stage, which is called Summit. Cost more, cost uh, 795 And this is, I think, in 2007. So I, I imagine the prices are probably more expensive now. Um, he says that Summit begins with a day of degradation where trainees are assigned alternate names, such as Daddy's Joy Toy, <laughs> Womb for Rent, Ew. Still Nursing, Peewee pervert, etc. <laughs> and then they're required to visualize themselves dying and being placed in coffins because they do not deserve to live. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, other, other degradations include having the overweight women dress up as cows, whales, and belly dancers Ugh. and be, and be ridiculed by, uh, the audience. Wow. I've lost, uh, seven pounds, by the way. No. Oh, really? And you didn't have to uh, have Dress somebody abuse like you cow. into it? No, I yeah. actually ate a lot of cow. That's, I ate know. a lot of cow. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Excellent. <clears throat> um, yeah. Impact training. Sounds creepy. Yeah. And they're, yeah. they're current. So uh, I'm careful what I say about them because these people kind of tend to – this kind of organization tends to uh, be really litigious. So right. I'm giving right. opinions. I'm not uh, – Yeah. Yeah. But they're, yeah. They're, and I, I guess the other personal thing is, is after the impact training um, – my stepmom became, I guess selfish isn't necessarily a bad thing, but she came, how's this? She was much less of the kind of person who would regard other people's feelings. Um, she basically abandoned uh, our family uh, in a lot of ways. And um, I, of course, you know, I'm not sure how much of this I can put on impact training or put on her specifically because a lot of the, the way she felt was revealed in um, a recording that was actually taken of her at, uh, at one of those tarot card readers or psychics. She loved to go to these psychics um, where she's basically waiting for my dad to die, like hoping for my dad's death and being disappointed Ugh. because the psychic told her that my dad would die in a month and he hadn't died yet. <laughs> so she's like, well, God. when's he going to die? Ugh. And she's like, well, you know, sometimes the, the psychic's like, well, sometimes I'm a little off on the timing. So, you know, he might have, um, he might have a car wreck soon because the other thing was my dad had, had 
completely kicked his prostate therapy's ass. So that was one of the reasons my stepmom had believed the psychic is because the psychic said my dad was going to die. He had prostate cancer, but he killed it in like a month or two, and he was just fine, and he's completely healthy now. And she she goes back to the psychic and is like, well, he didn't die. He, he got cured from his prostate cancer. And the psychic was like, well, you know, maybe it'll be a car wreck in a month or something <sighs> like that. <sighs> and so it, it, was, it was very callous and very much um, – Self-centered, and I can't help but but wonder if some of that self-centeredness came from this sort of impact training, where I guess a lot of times the goal is is to um, to only con- care about your immediate concerns, and, and also that the ends justifies the means. I mean, you can see it in their method that they don't care about hurting you in the in the meantime, as long as they get the approved results that they want. And I feel like that philosophy can bleed over into people. So that was my uh, sort of rant about impact training. Again, I haven't taken it myself, but uh, any kind of organization were, that abuses you to get to get you to do the things they want seems like a very questionable uh, practice to me. You were impacted by impact training. I, I was impacted by impact training, yes. I actually have some personal experience with another uh, – attack therapy cult well i'll call this one a cult i can't call impact therapy that because they still exist uh (laughs) there was something in the 70s and 80s called est est Mm -hmm. which was uh erhard seminars training which was founded by werner erhard it was a two-week course 60 hours where they basically lock you in a hotel uh conference room and yell at you and you know challenge you to change everything about you and remake you in their image Mm-hmm. Um, it's had a lot of notable participants, including Cher, Cloris Leachman, Yoko Ono, Jeff Bridges, John Denver, Diana Ross, and Douglas Engelbart, who basically invented the internet. We talked about him. Mm-hmm. He did that, the mother of all demos. He invented the computer mouse, the graphical user interface, right. networking, all sorts of things. Um, I don't know if these people had their successes despite this or because of this or what, um, but my uh my my experience with it was in 1984 i was in dc playing in this band called the day i lost my virginity with my friend peggy and this drummer named uh michael um sulkind who is an attorney now and michael sulkind took me to an est indoctrination meeting on halloween 1984 Ugh. And it's kind of interesting because I just now learned, looking at the Wikipedia article, that Est dissolved in late 1984. So I was there, you know, weeks before the end. And Mm. they were still behaving like it was an active, like, wonderful, like, this will change your life. Now, I was homeless at the time. I was literally living in an abandoned factory. And they gave this presentation of you know how great it is and people gave testimonials and again they didn't say what it really was and when people were asked they wouldn't really say Mm -hmm. but then they went around and broke up into groups and had people come around on the tables and try to hard sell you on it and you know it was like $550 for the seminar and they're like okay Michael your name's Michael how are you going to get the $550 and I'm like I don't know where my next meal is coming from literally and they're like no but this will really help you and you'll end up making money and it'll be great and do you have some family you can call do you have any friends can you borrow it uh do you have anything you can put up you know for collateral and get a loan i mean they were really hard sell and i was friggin' homeless and they were trying to get 550 bucks out of me yeah yeah well i feel like you get a sense of that from all these types of things is it's really more about um the self-interest of the people administering it but at the same time, they're selling it as something that's going to make you better. Yeah. Um, so I feel like they don't really have your best interest at heart. If if they're trying to get a homeless person to put up something for a loan uh, or to <laughs> ask his family for money so he can go to this rather than ask for help getting a job or uh, a house. an apartment. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm really wary by nature of anything like that um of anybody who's like this is the way this will help you this will change you which is actually why uh why i initially rejected libertarianism um because i ran into some people when i was about 18 who were libertarian Mm -hmm. party members who were very religious about it um they you know i don't think they wanted to lock me in a room and scream at me and you know 
I guess that's what we do on the Freedom Fiends, but people can turn us off. So <laughs> Exactly. We're not forcing anybody to listen to it. We're not bringing them to conventions and hard selling them on it and asking them to pawn all their guns so that no. they can listen to the we're, Freedom Fiends. We're more like AA. Our public relations policy is re- is based on attraction rather than promotion. Mm. Exactly, exactly. And, th- and that's a good point too. I think if you have some kind of um, – philosophy or something like that that you're trying to push you should just spit it out and let people decide on its own merits it should be about uh, the message itself and um, if a message itself is truly paradigm changing I think it's self-sustaining and I mean I think if 99% of the the people out there preaching liberty now just stopped preaching it I think another the same amount of people would step in immediately and start doing the same kind of work Um, I don't think that libertarianism can be considered a cult because of this kind of a thing. We're not secretive about it. Um, the argument is self-sustaining, and we're more than happy to explain it to somebody if they ask. Uh, but not proselytizing and going door to door and trying to force it on people. I just sent you a link. Um, grab it. I want to. I guess we could close up with this, unless you have. Do you have more to, on any of this? Before I go off on a tangent and tie it up in a pretty no, I, I think I think we've sort of wrapped up these uh, pseudo cult ish self help uh, programs, and I guess I just want to say uh, be wary of these kinds of things that promote to change your life if you'll only fork over a large amount of money. Yeah, well, I want to tie it back into the state. Um, if you check out that email I just sent you, there was a spin off. There were two spin offs. There was a spinoff of Synanon um, that was called The Seed. And The Seed turned into something called Straight Incorporated, which turned into... Scared which, Straight? Uh, clones, it, it, which begat dozens of clones and copycats, including Drug-Free America Foundation. Now, they're uh, connected with D.A.R.E. Right. So, right. Synanon has has a common ancestor or dare you know has a common ancestor or a direct lineage with this synonym attack therapy which was uh you know criminal and murderous <laughs> right 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 which also too to tie it back to the state um you know using our definition of a state it's not necessarily uh you know, your government worker, your people there, although they're part of the state or enabled by the state. The state is really the the mindset of violence being employed by a minority of the people who uh, have a moral past to commit violent acts and coercion. And I feel like that's that's pregnant within these kinds of synonym organizations or the straight organization. It's the idea that violence is okay and abuse is okay as long as we're trying to better you for your own good. As long as we're as, as long as the results are are the results we're looking for, then violence is perfectly okay. I'm reading from this site called Orange Papers, orange-papers.org, which um, started out as some an a sober guy who'd left AA, who's still sober, debunking AA. Um, uh. I don't agree with everything he says about AA, obviously, because I kind of like the idea of AA. But um, he has some some good research on this site. Uh, this is a section called Children's Gulags. Mm. And I'll link this. Um, First Lady Nancy Reagan repeatedly praised Straight Incorporated for their wonderful work. But they too ended up being just another vicious cult that tortured children in the name of rehabilitating young drug users and who hid the tortured children when Nancy and the news cameras came to visit. Wow. Yeah, and I've heard about these before. I think some libertarians have done exposés on these so-called children's gulags. I don't know if I've ever heard them put that way. <laughs> but basically these things that uh, – and sometimes there's court – the court will order kids to uh, attend these sort of rehab programs or these get straight type programs. And so they are in bed with the state. Um, and and yeah, I, I've – I've heard a lot about how they they can abuse children, uh, sometimes taking them overseas. And um, I mean, I don't know if slave labor is the word, but basically forcing them into things and treating them like they're less than human. Um, And not only is the state involved with things like judges uh, supporting these kinds of things, but also the state is involved for the mentality. 
the mentality that if your child uh, wants to experiment with substances, then he's some kind of lost cause who must be beaten up into a pulp and remolded into a good little citizen of the state. I think that that mentality is where this all comes from. That's what creates the market for it. Yep. And uh, there's another thing on here about a a rehab camp based on that kind of stuff run by someone named Colonel Chuck Long. And if you scroll down the pictures here, there's one of Chuck Long with George Bush, George W. Bush, and another of him receiving an award from Colin Powell. <laughs> ah, <laughs> yeah. If those are your friends, then you're a bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess you can yes. judge a man by his friends just as easily as you can judge him by his enemies. So, yeah. Ugh. Long claims it was General Colonel Colin Powell who suggested that he go into the children's boot camp business. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. So, of course, because because uh, the military wants good little brainwashed citizens, so might as well break them like their horses before they get sent to the military, and then the military will have an easier go of it, won't they? How many deaths is Colin Powell responsible for, would you guess? Oh, tons. And, ha and how? I, well, I would give him some... I, I don't know what he was... Well, I guess not during that one. Okay, so if you just start with the Iraq War which he was instrumental in selling to the American public. Um, you know, the higher estimates for deaths in the Iraq war are around a million. Um, and they, they range to much lower than that, half a million and lower. But um, I would say a conservative estimate would be at least half a million deaths. It's hard to say with war because it's not just people killed by the enemy's bullets. It's people who are starved afterwards or you know, killed by the warlords that spring up or... In my estimation, though, I still count those. I do, too. Because I, 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 I count war as the ultimate state but, intervention. But those aren't generally in the official numbers. Yeah, yeah. Depends on, depends on who's compiling the numbers. If, yeah, and, if, you know... Even people who don't die, their lives are ruined. You know, if you're right. if if you're a refugee whose home has been bombed and you can't go back to your hometown, uh, right. you know, you're not dead, right. but you're not counted in the numbers of of problems of war. Yeah, yeah. And again, uh, as good little um, uh, Austrian economists, we have to go back and count the the unseen as well. You know, all the opportunity <laughs> costs, all the all the babies that that weren't born, as as Scott Horton's fond of pointing out all the babies that that weren't born because they were incinerated in the womb or weren't born because the the young couple that was trying to create them was incinerated by by a bombing um what, what about the geniuses that could have been born then and and could have invented something like flying cars <laughs> or <laughs> or anything that that could have made life better all the opportunity costs vis-a-vis -vis that um the people that didn't get born the, the people that didn't grow up or the people that could have grown up to be productive members of society but now uh are so obsessed with vengeance because their whole family was killed. I I think that we can conclude this by saying that uh, state involvement in drug rehab is a bad thing where state involvement with anything is a bad thing and always makes things worse. And there's a, there's a quote on this page about children's gulags from H.L. Mencken that uh, I think is a really good <laughs> ender here. The urge to save humanity is almost always a false face for the urge to rule it. Ooh. Yeah, that's excellent. That's excellent. Um, Menken's is responsible for tons of excellent quotes, and I think that – I haven't heard that one before, but that is one of my new favorites, I would say, of libertarian quotes in general. Yeah. Excellent. So yeah, if you if you <laughs> he, and he was if you want to save was, the, if you want if you want to save the world, just put your ideas out there. And if yeah. they're truly world saving, they will be picked up regardless. Um, and if you want to save yourself, uh, learn on your own or find somebody close to you that's that will help you volunteer not only voluntarily but will help you because they truly care for you, not because they want to uh, exploit you. Worms. Worms. Peace. Hello, Freedom Fiends. It's your boy, me from the U.S. Get the U.S. out my bloodstream. I owe me and that include endorphins. No one won't ask permission and I won't say please. Freedom Fiends, the fact that I gotta make clear The Freedom Fiends podcast is covered by a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 3.0 license. Do what you want with it and spread it around. Tell two friends. Make copies. Email it to everyone you know. Go on the site and comment. 
This is a conversation. Every week, we'll have an exciting new episode where Michael W. Dean and Nima Vadadi weave their own unique take on the way the world works and how to find your place in it. Available from freedomfiends.com. That's F-R-E-E-D-O-M-F-E-E-N-S dot com. Freedom Fiends is proudly syndicated by Alterati.com and the Liberty Radio Network at LRN.FM. Subscribe and tell two friends. And remember, the only power they have is the power you allow them. We're not saying the Freedom Fiends are the one true path to anarchist liberation, but it's a good one. If you want to put your voluntarist money where your mouth is, consider making a donation to the Freedom Fiends. Go to freedomfiends.com and click on the spinning coin on any post. Then make a one-time gift via PayPal or set up a monthly contribution of as little as $3. Giving to the Freedom Fiends helps advance education of horizontal liberation throughout the world. The Freedom Fiends. We work hard, so send us some money.